Okay, hello everybody. Uh, in person and watching online, my name is uh, Bill Hurt. I, I work for uh, Puppet and I help run the Portland PowerShell user group. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors. Our venue sponsor, Viewpoint Software, has been uh, great for us for, I, I want to say, like at least a couple years now. Is that right? Uh, been great to us. A another year down, so thanks to Viewpoint. Uh, I want to thank our corporate sponsor, uh, Sapien Software, who's been great to us for quite a long time now, actually. Uh, and for the in-person uh, people and for after the event, we actually have a swag box that Sapien has sent us with some really cool items in it. So, uh, and, and those will keep coming to the meeting if we don't uh, eat all of those up um, at this meeting. So uh, if you're interested in some Sapien swag, please do come in person for the next meeting. Uh, for all the uh, in-person attendees, we're going to wait until after the stream to do our usual, uh, you know, introductions and networking and uh, PowerShell news, chat, and that kind of thing. If you're watching online and if any of that sounds uh, interesting, please do come in person next time. Uh, we don't bite. Uh, for the presentation this week, we have Justin Grody. Is that how I say your name? Justin Grody? I think I mispronounced it last time. <laughs> we have Justin Grody talking about the PowerShell terminal and all the stuff that you can do to customize it and all the neat new capabilities that it, that it has. Uh, this new Windows terminal is, it, it's just really great. I can't really, uh, if you spend all of your time in, in the terminal like a lot of us who do PowerShell do, uh, you need to check this out because it is, it is functional and it is just a lot of fun, like I, I think you're gonna see in just a little bit. It's a lot of fun. Um, so we'll give Justin just a second to, to put the microphone on and uh, he'll start as uh, soon as he's ready. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks, Bill. All right, so welcome everybody. Thanks for coming today. My name is Justin Grody. I'm a data center solutions architect with Ally Digital. Um, we do a lot of IT management and transformations for companies worldwide. Um, and as a result, a lot of our work we have to do, we do at scale. And we found PowerShell to be an extremely useful tool for automating that and gluing our various disparate systems together. You know, it's the glue that holds a lot of our infrastructure together. And more and more so with tools like Azure Functions and such, it's the primary language that we use to develop new solutions. So I'm going to show off today a little bit about the new Windows Terminal from Microsoft. Um, the new Windows Terminal um, is still in a preview state, but you can, right, as of now, just go out to the Microsoft Store and install it and play with it. It doesn't replace anything you already have, so it's, there's nothing wrong with you just installing it and trying it out. I'm just going to show off some cool things that it can do um, and uh, some constructs about how um, that in the terminal, some things that kind of make things helpful and things that really go a long way towards um, really making the Windows Terminal a lot more powerful and a lot more like a lot of the other kind of third-party tools that have been used kind of to supplant this, like CMDR. And then if you're familiar with, um, with uh, Linux terminals, things like Xterm and such, and like the terminal that's built into Visual Studio Code, um, this is Microsoft's real effort to really bring it up to those levels. And I think they're doing an extremely good job on that. So the first step is let's all get hyped because Microsoft has this great hype video that they made for, and I just, I, I just want to show this without any real introduction. I love that video because it's so goofy. It's just like it's not an iPhone. Come on, but it's it was. Kind of, I don't know. I don't know who like got tasked with making that video, but they did a good job. I was, I'm impressed. So that was just kind of a quick overview. But I mean, one of the things that you saw in there is one of the really cool things about the Windows terminal is how infinitely customizable it is because. Um, all of us, you know, we have our environments, and again, as, as Bill said, when you spend so much time in this type of environment, being able to make it comfortable for you, whether you like light or dark themes, whether you're colorblind, whether you have 
certain preferences in terms of being able to make things pop out to you. You know, that all seems like just kind of fluff and nice, but it really does make you more productive. When you're used to certain things, you're used to certain errors coming up in certain colors, Once, when you're used to that type of environment, it's really easy for your eye to just track right to issues and be more efficient as opposed to looking at a blank, you know, no color terminal or a notepad. You know, that's why we have syntax highlighting. That's why you have these things. Like these, these seemingly aesthetic things really do matter for your productivity. So this is just a quick overview of a lot of the different styles that some people have done with um, Windows Terminal. You know, you can go old school, you can do all kinds of different things, you can make custom, custom prompts. I mean, there's lots of variation in all the different ways you can go about it. So that's the core of my slides, because I'm not really a slides guy, so we're going to go straight into demo time. So this is the Windows Terminal. I'm just going to go ahead and close it down, because I want to go ahead and open it again just to show it comes right up. Like, this is not a takes forever to load type terminal. Close it again, bring it up, right up. And so I have reset this to the factory defaults, minus my fancy prompt here, which I'll just uh, take away for now. Just a simple, go for simple PowerShell prompt. So, you know, so this part, you know, very familiar. Everything looks kind of same. Uh, you'll notice, like, the highlighting looks very similar to, like, when you're doing just a regular PowerShell prompt. In fact, I can bring one up here. And you know, these can match pretty close, except for my goofy prompt here. And my PS read line beta, which freaks out all the time. But you know, these, you know, these can be fairly close. You can have the similar kind of highlighting if my PS read line would keep freaking out. Yeah, it's going to be that way. Anyhow, you can tell I never use the classic one anymore because I love the new Windows terminal. But you know, right off the bat, you're already in kind of a familiar environment. And so in this drop down, again, this is right off the bat without me touching anything. I already have my PowerShell and my command. And in here, there are um, multiple things already in here. So I, with zero configuration, when you open this, I have um, Windows Subsystem for Linux installed. With the, it, if you're not familiar with what Windows Subsystem for Linux is, in the newer versions, and this is WSL2, which if you've used WSL1, use WSL2, because WSL1 was incredibly slow. They fixed that stuff in 2. It's excellent now. And, um, what this does is it just starts a little tiny little virtual machine. It basically all Windows kind of have a little built-in Hyper-V kernel in them now. And so this just runs whatever Linux you want. I have Alpine here, which is a nice lightweight one, but you can do Ubuntu, SUSE, Red Hat, uh, CentOS, whatever you want, directly on your Windows machine. And it just runs there in a very convenient way. I'll go a little bit more about WSL towards the end, but I just kind of wanted to show that that's there. I didn't do any setup. It automatically figured out that I had WSL on my computer and found the distributions that I had. If I had other distributions installed here, they just would have shown up in the menu without anything. And also Azure Cloud Shell comes right in. If you're not familiar with Azure Cloud Shell, this is basically a, um, a version of Bash or PowerShell that runs on the Azure platform. And it's basically a little, just, it's a little container virtual machine is what it is that runs in their environment and it synchronizes all your settings with an Azure storage account. It basically costs nothing. It's like, you know, two cents a month and that's just for the storage account that it's associated with your back end. And it gives you a lot of power to be out there. It also gets its own identity. So if, if you run a lot of Azure commands, um, really recommend checking out Cloud Shell because it's a great way to centrally store things. And not only can you access it from here, you can access it from the browser, you can access it from all kinds of places. So yeah, that's just a summary to show that there's all these things in here just right out of the box. And if you go to the settings, the settings by default is a JSON file. And so this is the settings file that it creates by default. Let me blow that up a little bit. Hide my terminal here. So here in the settings file, you have a, a couple different sections here. So they, um, in later versions, there will be a nice GUI editor for this, but for now, it's uh, a, uh, just a JSON file. And so you have your sections for your profiles and those different things. And they're pretty straightforward to read. You have a unique WID, and you'll notice there's some highlighting here. Um, you'll notice this defines a schema, and that's really nice because an editor like Visual Studio Code can t read, realize that there's a schema, take it, and automatically get auto completion without any kind of special extensions. It's just built in. So if I'm on like a profile here and I start a new item, I've already got IntelliSense. That IntelliSense comes from that JSON schema. So this isn't built into the tool. This works any tool that can support JSON schemas. So it's really nice for when you're writing new configurations. You know, it's like, oh, okay, great. I got this. I got an idea of what that command does and what are the different options for it, et cetera. So the reason I spent a little time on this config is this is sort of the heart of everything. And the nice thing about it is that as you make changes, things update in real time. So if I take this Windows PowerShell one, I say I don't want to see it anymore, I can do hidden true, and I just click control save there, 
and because I'm probably messed up something there in the between. Yeah, it's because I put this little guy in here. So I, I do a valid JSON save, hopefully. And now the Windows PowerShell is gone. So as you make changes, the second you click save, it refreshes the shell, with, it refreshes the terminal with your new settings. So we can take that and exploit it. In addition to that, there's all kinds of um, extra things which I'll go into in a minute. So you saw that I have the tabs up here and they're really nice, they're very clean, you know, they have a nice, pretty decent theme to them. But you can do other funny things. This is one thing that was added very recently in a new preview, is I'm just gonna do Alt Shift equals and I can split it. So now I can have two terminals going separately and they don't have to be the same thing. One can be PowerShell, one can be Commander and I don't have to stop there, I can split it that way, split it that way, split it that way, split it that way, it's like however, however deep you wanna go, they support it. And th these are all separate active terminals and you can see it kind of highlights it's not as obvious in this theme, but it, uh, it's kind of highlighting the border for the one that I'm in. So if you've got one task running and you want to work on something else, you can just split it, work on that other task, and then close it out when you're done. So we'll go ahead and bring a PowerShell session back up here. Don't mind my fancy prompt there. I'll talk about that in a minute. And so I have this nice little demo script that I have. I'll show this script. This is all out on a GIST, which will be in the links in the presentation. Um, but all this is is just, I, it's just basically a simple way to set up a hash table that is the name and then the script block I want to run. And it just wraps it in this nice little menu interface where I can do something, show how it works, and come back. So first thing I'm going to do is factory reset my Windows terminal. So to do that, the command that's going to run is just remove item. And if you look at this path here, it's kind of, it looks a little deep, but it's pretty easy to interpret. So under app data local, under packages, um, the Windows terminal is a UWP app. So it's, it's a universal Windows app. And so it stores its stuff in a Windows universal spot. And so under that, under local state, is this profiles.json. So that thing that I went to when I clicked the settings, that's this file. And so now I'm just gonna blow that file away. So I just clicked enter, it went, blew the file away. And now I'm gonna go back to my terminal and close it, open it back up, and here I am back to the defaults again. Um, what it, and it'll automatically just regenerate what you need for your settings. By the way, if you've been playing with Windows Terminal and um, you say like had a version older than 0.5, you're gonna wanna actually do this because a lot of stuff changed with how the JSON stuff works. And you're pretty much gonna wanna blow it away and start over. You don't have to, but it's recommended because of some things which I'll show here in a minute. So, um, so that's one item there. So we'll go ahead and bring, bring the demo back up. So um, let's just go ahead and I'm just gonna show, I'm gonna skip, um, bring up my custom one just for a second and show what the default settings look like. So to bring up the default settings, I'm just running this Code Insiders. I'm running the um, preview version of Visual Studio Code, but you could also do code. You can also use Notepad or whatever. Dash R just says means open it in the same window. And I'm gonna open that default file. You can also get to this if you go to the PowerShell, or excuse me, to Windows Terminal, and you go to Settings and you hold down Alt while you click Settings. That will also bring up the defaults. So what's nice about this is this lets you see every single setting that's available. You don't need any documentation or anything, it's all there. So it, all the different kind of global settings, what the different default profiles are. So here we got PowerShell, let me blow this up again. So here we got PowerShell, we've got you know the standard command, um, and then we have some of the themes that are built in. So you have Campbell, that's the code name for sort of the more modern theme, but sort of the more traditional like command line theme. Um, there's Campbell PowerShell, which is basically the same thing, but with the blue background, what, what you're used to seeing if you open the normal PowerShell prompt. Um, vintage, uh, if you know, know, the, know the one half theme from like the Atom editor, that's in here built in now. No work need to be done, both the dark and the light version. Um, a lot of people are a fan of the Solarize theme, so that's in here, both the dark and the light version. And then all the different key bindings. If you want to know what the key bindings are, you don't have to go find a help file, they're all right here and every single key binding is customizable. So if there's something you don't like, there's something you don't like how it binds, you don't like any of those things, focus, new tabs, all of this you can change. If you want to um, not have that key binding, you just null it out. If you want to bind it to something else, you just add one of these lines into your personal file. But this basically gives you an idea of like what's underneath. So when you have this, when you go back to your main profiles, that's why these are so truncated, is your main profile overlays on top of that defaults JSON. This is new in the newer, the new version that came out, so that you only have to specify the basics in your profile and it will automatically fill in the rest from the default. 
It's also pretty smart in terms of if you screw up your JSON, if you mistype it, like you saw me, it'll pop up errors, but it will, it will preserve everything else as if it's working. It's pretty good at like, you know, if you screw up, it'll warn you that your JSON's not valid, but it won't crash the terminal. It'll just, it'll just, it'll keep whatever default settings are still there, and then layer on whatever settings you did have working that weren't a complete mess. Those will go on top and still work. And I showed that earlier, but I can do it again here. Like on my main profile, you know, I can just delete something out there. And as soon as I click save, it comes up. But what's nice is like, you know, they give you a nice helpful thing and even tell you what line you screwed up on and how you screwed up. And then you can go back and fix it. So since I screwed that up, I'm just going to do another factory reset. And so, um, so then the next thing will be, um, you know, once you get playing around with this, you can do some kind of fancy stuff. And so now I'm going to restore what is my personal Windows pr terminal profile, which will also be available on the slide. So all it's going to do is I got this, my Windows Terminal Profile file there, save my documents. I also have this backed up a million places. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy that file there. So this is one of the really nice things, is instead of having to click through a bunch of menus to get your terminal just how you want it to, it's all in one JSON. So if you get your terminal just how you like it, you can replicate that to as many computers as you want. So I'm just going to enter to run this command and see, oh, wait, the font changed. And, oh, look, there's all this new stuff in here. It refreshes the second you save, and that's really awesome. It's like as you go through, as you're tweaking it, um, you're, you know, you're able to see your changes in real time for what you do, and that's really cool as opposed to have to close it, reopen it, close it, reopen it. You can tune, tweak, change your icons, et cetera, just how you like them. Okay, so now that I'm there, I'm going to start, and my new, now my new default tab is a PowerShell preview tab because I like PowerShell preview because PowerShell 7 is rad, and you should be playing with it if you're not playing with it yet. Um, and so a couple things that are, you can see in this customization, never mind the prompt part, but you'll see down in the lower right here, I got a nice little pulsing icon to show me, oh, just to remind me that I, what terminal I'm in. The color's kind of sort of more subtle, it may not be able to see, but it's called kind of subtly purple, which is kind of the unofficial color of preview. And those little cues c can make a difference. Like when you have like four terminals open, you may forget which one's the PowerShell terminal and which one's the command terminal, which one's your Alpine terminal. And now those, these little subtle cues there can really help. So here's a bunch of different terminals that I have. I'm just going to go ahead and bring up those settings and just kind of give an idea of what these look like. So these are very similar to what you saw, just with a bunch of few extra things. And if maybe it's a little bit of fancy stuff in here, which I'll go over later about, like some extra stuff that I put in there to make some stuff that I have work. But those custom, those custom uh, logos and stuff, I just saved them off into this roaming folder, and it has this special syntax so that wherever that roaming folder is, it automatically finds it. And then the background, the alignment. Um, there's this thing called acrylic, which is a Windows 10 thing. You probably notice there's kind of a transition, translucent thing here. I have something kind of hide the windows hiding behind there. You'll notice it gives it kind of this nice translucent glassy feel. And so that's you know that's just a nice kind of aesthetic thing. But you know it also helps like if you have like a really bright window open under it. You know it's pretty easy to see. You can see like the listing of my details and everything. That's a bad example. Let me bring up Notepad just for a better example. And so you can see how you can see your underlaid windows on there. So it's a nice aesthetic, it's pretty nice. It's not, you know, it's not deal breaking, but it, you know, it's not super groundbreaking, I mean, but it's kind of nice. Um, and when you lose focus off the window, it takes off the acrylic. So it does, because this is a GPU driven um, operation, but when you don't have focus on the window, it doesn't eat up your GPU doing that. So let's go through a few of these tabs that I've established. Oh, one other thing, I'll just go through one of my favorite shortcuts. If you do Alt Enter, there's your Zen mode. It takes over the whole screen, and you can just focus on your code, just focus on what you're doing. And again, Alt-Enter by default, you can make that whatever you want. If you want to control Alt-Z, you want it, you know, control Shift o doesn't matter. You can set them up however you want. Anything I show you, it's all customizable. So I'm going to drop back out of that. Um, so let's look at a couple of these different tools. So I showed the PowerShell preview as I had before. Um, so I also have PowerShell Core, good old stamp stalwart. Again, different icon down here, just so I, again, I kind of know where I'm at. Nice little pulse. Um, different prompts, and I chose those icons. I'll sh um, when I get back to the demo, I'll show where those icons live. Some of them are built in, like as I showed when I just did a default with nothing, how it had like the icons and PowerShell and all that worked. But some of these icons, like the PowerShell preview, the SSH, the Alpine, the Cloud Shell, those ones I, I chose, I built, and I saved. And all the icons that I use here will be available in the GIST as well. I didn't have time to make like an easy setup script. I'll make that available and add it to the GIST when I can. And that'll just be an IEX IWR git.io slash Justin's terminal. 
you do that and it'll install everything and set up your terminal exactly the same way my terminal set up. So back up your config before you do that. In fact, I'll add a thing to back up your config before it does that, but. Um, so yeah, PowerShell core, but here's another thing, like PowerShell remoting, like you don't really see this in a lot of the demos. This is something that I added. It's pretty easy to just sort of write a kind of fairly simple wrapper to make this work. So I'm just gonna choose PowerShell remoting. I'm gonna put in the host of a computer that I have. And we'll see how well my tethering still works. And there is, so I'm now in a remote PowerShell session on this server, which is down in LA. And I can do all the same stuff I normally would. But again, it's, you know, so it's, it's like an SSH session, but it's actually using that PowerShell remoting. And in this case, this is a Linux system. So this isn't a Windows system. This is a Linux system. It's an Ubuntu system. And so it, but you can set, PowerShell 7 is at the point where you can use it as your login shell now. Like if I want ZSH, I can just do ZHH and it'll be there. Well, not with the implicit session, but I'll show that next. Um, but you can use PowerShell as your primary everywhere. Like that's the goal of, you know, PowerShell 6.2, it works pretty good, but the goal of PowerShell 7 is that it works everywhere. You're able to replace Windows PowerShell with it, run on Windows, run on Linux, run it on little Arduino devices if you want to, there's an ARM version, run it everywhere. Everywhere you need it, it's there. To become as ubiquitous as ZSH or Bash or anything that you're used to having, having PowerShell be at that level, but have all the power of, of, of PowerShell and the .NET framework behind it. So again, this, this is a Linux instance, it's just running, I just wanted to show this, and this was actually using the remoting, there if um, PowerShell remoting can work over SSH now, it doesn't just have to be over WinRM. So this remoting, it automatic, um, I have a little piece in my script that basically just has, does kind of a quick port test, and it looks to see if the, if the remote management is open and if the SSH is open. And if the, if the SSH is open but the WinRM isn't open, it intelligently th realize, thinks, okay, you know, this is probably a Linux server. I'm gonna try to do my remoting with SSH first. And if that fails, I'll try falling back to WinRM. And then vice versa for a Windows server. If he's a Windows server, I'm gonna try WinRM first. And if that fails, I'm gonna try SSH if the SSH port is open. So pretty handy. Um, so then next item I have here, just good old Windows PowerShells we've seen before. Um, same deal, uh, again, nice little old classic logo down there. And again, same background, still has this kind of acrylic um, effect to it. Um, one thing I didn't show about, notice by the way too, is like when I did that, when I did this implicit remoting, you probably noticed I didn't have to enter a password. Because I did it over SSH, the Windows version of SSH has a plugin for KeyPass, which here's an example of a KeyPass system, um, where you can keep your SSH keys in there. And so just by unlocking your KeyPass, it acts as your pageant, if you're familiar with PuTTY, or your SSH agent, and it works with PuTTY too. But it acts as your SSH agent, so when you go through, it'll automatically pull keys out of there and do your connections. So it's really handy, you have single sign-on anywhere you've put your SSH key. All that kind of real good Linuxy stuff that you're kind of used to, you can have it all in PowerShell now. So let's, um, beyond Windows PowerShell, so I have one for SSH here. Um, I use the PuTTY logo here just because I'm so comfortable with associating the PuTTY icon with SSH, so that, that again, that's my warm and fuzzy. It's not accurate because this is not actually PuTTY. This is using the open SSH that's been ported to Windows, which works great. Um, but you know, again, I'm, I'm comfortable with the PuTTY logo because again, when I'm working, I see this icon up here, I like to know, okay, that's, I know what that is. You know, I know that's an SSH session. Um, and again, tiny, I'll do the same thing. And so this time I got a session. So this is a ZSH prompt using the spaceship theme, which I like, um, but I can just fire up uh, PowerShell here. And there's my PowerShell inside, again, it's a Linux machine, it is Linux. Yep, there it is. I think this is uh, one of my Ubuntu systems. Yeah, so it's Ubuntu 16.04 running it. This is just a VPS out on one of our systems in Los Angeles that I just use for random stuff. But again, no password required. Use my shell. And I'll show what, you know, again, this config is there. If you download my config, this is ready to go. All it is is, this is just a PowerShell wrapper. It's actually all in the config. So if I show here, um, if I zoom this out a bit. Uh, so here's like the PowerShell remoting. So here's the SSH one, pretty straightforward. It's just, I start a PowerShell session with no profile. Um, I add this little WT profile thing, which just, it makes it easy for some stuff I'm gonna show later. Auto when I was talking about how it auto-detected which, um, which window I was in, this is how I do it. And um, the later versions of Terminal are gonna add something to do this for me, but for me, I, I hacked this together because I, I wanted to be clever, so. But all it is is just, like, this is all just PowerShell. It's just like, I'm just starting a uh, PDOSH thing and I'm just doing dash C for command. And then I got it in quotes, escaped quotes. But all I'm doing is I'm doing a read host for the host name. That's how you get the host name prompt. 
then I take that host name, uh, clear the screen so that it looks nice, and then I do an SSH um, reading my personal config because there's a bug here where it doesn't read your default config. I blame Steve at Microsoft and the PowerShell team for that, and it's on him to fix it right now. But, um, but the, and then just that host name, and that's it. So this is just kind of idea that if there's anything you can think of that you can run in a terminal, you can make a profile of it. If you have a, you know, you could put a build script in this where you just open a tab and it just starts that build script and then, and then comes up. Anything you can put in a terminal, because remember the, the PowerShell or uh, command prompt in the terminal are two different things. The terminal is just an interface to it. So just like the web browser is interface to whatever's behind it, but you know, the web browser isn't tied directly to that thing. So anything you can get to run in kind of a terminal type session, just like you would in VS Code or anything else, you can make a PowerShell profile for it. You can make a Windows terminal profile for it. So those are some examples of those. Um, you'll see on my tabs here too, I just edit my tab title. I like having my titles so that they don't really show much, but like I also have this thing in a custom prompt I have here where if I go to documents, see how it updated my top thing? And now it looks the same. And I can keep going to there. And it just keeps updating however deep I'm going and I can just come back, and because I'm at home, again, that's all done in my PowerShell prompt script. My prompt script just says set title, and uh, Windows Terminal respects it. There's also settings where you can suppress it. So for instance, when I'm doing this SSH session, SSH likes to pop up and put all its logos all over the friggin' title screen, and it makes my whole title look thing. So I told it to override that. I just wanted to have this nice little simple prompt. And eventually, and I'm gonna add a thing where it will bring in, it'll just say, you know, my username at where I was. Like I like to have those things nice and clean so that I can have a lot of tabs open but not have them all crowd each other. And again, same thing here. If I'm here and I wanna do this, I can do my, my little split thing. And so while I'm working over there, I can be back on my local terminal trying other things. So very helpful, very handy, very easy to just kinda of go back and forth, work on things here, there. So let's kill all these out real quick. Um, so then there's a couple more remote things, so I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to click this Alpine guy. Oh, I, I, I probably should not skip, of course, the venerable command prompt. If you need CMD, you love it. I got my nice little, cute little C prompt down there, and this is, this is just good old CMD. You know, you're, you know, none of this stuff works yeah, as you expect. It's all just, just basic CMD type stuff. But it's still there. So like you want it, you know, you can have it there. I have it there. I never use it. I just keep it there just in case. It, it starts up fast, so that's nice. You know, you want to demo this kind of splitty thing. Man, it, it, you know, it comes up super fast. But All right, so, um, so back to this Alpine guy. So this is Alpine Linux. And so what this is is that um, this is, again, we're in Linux, is Linux. But what this is, this is actually a virtual machine running on my local computer. But I don't see it. It's all handled in Hyper-V, it's all handled behind the scenes, and it automatically starts and stops it for me. It even reclaims the memory. If I, if I walk away from it, it's sort of like a container if you're used to containers, but it's actually a full operating system running locally on the system. Um, and so, and it'll tie in all the file systems. So this mount C users J Grody is my C users J Grody, same location. But I can just go to like the normal home drive and it's there. And I have all the same things there, and I have all my different folders I can see. I'll, I'll talk about this fancy prompt stuff. I, I know you probably have questions about that. I'll, I'll show how that works. That's towards the end. Um, and so all that works just normally how you would expect. So I can go to my mount, et cetera, C. Um, so this is, you know, this is a full Linux system. I mean, PSOX, you know, there, there's the processes. There's everything that this Linux system is running. I'm running on Alpine Linux. Alpine Linux is what a lot of containers are built on. It's an extreme, it's, it's like, bare bones, only what you need, and then you just add into it what you want. Whereas like Ubuntu is more user friendly, SUSE has certain things, CentOS, all that stuff works here. And if you open it up, it would look just like an Ubuntu machine like you saw anywhere else. I just like Alpine Linux on here because I'm usually using it to just like run one or two little things. And because I have this crappy Surface still and my Surface laptop has been delayed in shipping and it will be here, I'm looking forward to my new hotness here very soon, but until that shows up, I can't afford a whole lot of memory on this poor guy between PowerPoints and Microsoft Teams, which is a killer. Etc. So here in the memory, it's going to be way down here. It's going to be like VMM, um, if I can even find it. Yeah, like it takes, like if you're doing Alpine Linux, it takes almost nothing because it's just basically the kernel and these very bare bones processes I have to get started. So, but what's kind of neat about this is that because it's this um, Windows subsystem for Linux, um, everything is kind of tied together. So if I go back to my home drive, and say I'm in here like, oh, what's this test.xml? 
I can type explorer here. Oh, no, I forgot that. I had to explore.exe, I think. Alpine Linux is a little finicky. Look at that. I was, I was in a Linux terminal. I typed explorer, and it opened up that same folder right there. Well, what's something else I can do? Well, maybe I can do uh, code insiders test.xml. And there, now it's opened my, my thing in here. And there's another thing I'm not going to show here, but there's this thing about, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the Visual Studio Code part of this because I'm just using it as an editor, like Notepad or anything else. But you can also have Visual Studio Code running inside your virtual machine, headless, and have the other part be a front end to it called PowerShell Remoting. Or, excuse me, Visual Studio Code Remoting, remote development. It's really cool. Recommend checking it out. Not going to spend a lot of time on it right now. So, again, here's my Windows terminal. And typically, this would be another program, or this would be my VMware console or something else. But it's right here. And you saw how fast, by the way, that virtual machine was not running when I started this demo. When I clicked here and went to Alpine, it dynamically, Hyper-V started it up. It went through its boot process and bam, it's there. Like its own standalone virtual machine running completely independent of my system. It's got its own IP address and everything. You know, this is not a container. It's its own dedicated virtual machine. And so you have it there. And again, nice themes. You know, I got my nice little tux over here, and I got this nice kind of sky blue color for WSL. But again, it's helpful if I'm here. And I'm like, I'm on a conference call or something. I come back, I'm like, oh, crap, which prompt? Was, OK, no, I want to be in my WSL prompt. So having, the, having those kind of visual context is really helpful to really kind of drive that stuff. All right, so let's go to the fun stuff. Let's go back to the demo. If I can remember what I named it. OK, so we did a few of these. Um, so it, the icons I was talking about. So we'll go for. So this is going to bring up my Explorer to this location under Local App Data Packages, Windows Terminal, Roaming State. Now, you can store your icons wherever you want. It's just this location, if you noticed, I had those um, special URLs that were like appx colon slash slash roaming slash. Um, this location, it'll track there. And if you have roaming profiles and all that stuff, it'll follow you as you go because that's part of how the universal packages work. So I like putting them there so that when I upgrade my computer to do stuff, they're still there. So. Um, all these, a lot of these icons are just ones that I personally made, and I'll, I'll have them as part of the GIST so you can download them and, and have them available. But this is just one place you can keep them. But every one of these things, like that pulsing GIF is here, the icons that are up here at the top um, there. I have one for administrator, so like I have a thing where if I'm in an administrative Windows terminal prompt, it recognizes it, it sets the background red, and it puts that little red icon. Because when, you know, when I'm doing stuff as admin, you know, I want to make sure I know that I'm doing it. So when I do my remove item, recurse, I know that like, be really careful that you do a what if on that before you do. Again, visual context make a big deal. Yeah. When, when you do the administrator, you have to launch the whole terminal? Yeah, because, um, because the, because a process, oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the question was that if you have a Windows terminal, um, like, if you want to have an admin terminal, do you have to launch a whole separate process? And yes, that's just, that's an underlying thing of Windows. So if, and you know, in my case, I just, usually it's not that bad because I usually just do control shift click and then just accept that. Or if you disable UAC, you don't even see that. So it's not that, but you can just do Control Shift in the icon, and boom, you have an admin terminal. But you can't have them in the same window because a non-admin process can't launch an admin process for obvious security reasons. And that's just, that's just a fact of Windows life, and the Windows, power, the Windows terminal team was not able to get an exception to that for, again, obvious reasons. So. So I'll bring the demo back up here. OK, so now we'll get into some, some of the um, kind of fancy stuff you can do. OK, so now we know that the terminal whole configuration is just a JSON file. And we know that when we edit that JSON file, it updates the terminal in real time. So if we have programs and stuff that can interact with that JSON file, maybe we can do some cool stuff in real time. So a guy, um, um, a guy GP Duck online, um, came up with, the, had, had this idea, and he's like, well, what if I write a PowerShell module that lets me control everything in Windows Terminal with commandlets? And all it does is read the JSON, change something in the JSON, save it back. Thus, MS Terminal Settings was born. So there is a, there is a um, PowerShell module called MS Terminal Settings that you can download, install, and do all kinds of fun stuff with. And I'm going to show some of that here in a minute. Um, I like this. I thought it was a good idea, so I ended up contributing to it. And again, this open source model is like, I don't own the project. I just made some things that I like with it. I sent the guy some pull requests. Uh, we discussed it a bit, and he merged it. And so now my code is part of that project. 
even though I don't own it, I have nothing to do with it, other than the fact that I was like, hey, there's something I want to fix. And you know, that's really a lot of what the new PowerShell movement is about, and the new open source friendly Microsoft, is that if you can, you know, that you know, you can get stuff in. Like almost all, there's so many of the new PowerShell 7 features that were not written by people at Microsoft. They were written by the community, like for each parallel. That was not, that was a, a side contribution. Um, the new Git error, that, that was a side contribution. Written by people who are not part of Microsoft but just have a passion about PowerShell and want to fix it. And as they always like to show in the demos, like you don't have to be a programmer. If there's just an error message that's super obtuse, you can go in and just change the text of that error message, submit a pull request, and your new error message will now be part of the PowerShell that goes out to tens, hundreds of millions of people. So, um, so just to show some of the stuff we can do there, um, I'm going to do the detect current terminal profile. So here's kind of an example. So one of the things that's important is that before we can make a change to our profile, we have to know which one we have. So I wrote this piece that um, uses a bunch of hints about where you're at in order to figure out which terminal you're in. Um, so this is not a command that's directly exposed from MS terminal, from the MS terminal settings. Let me blow this up a bit. Um, it's not directly exposed from the module. It's actually an internal module. So if you've never seen this syntax before, this is a way to run a private uh, method inside a PowerShell module if you need to get at it. So that it, you have the call symbol, which you're probably used to for running external commands. But in parentheses, you actually put the name of the module. So in this case, I'm just importing the module directly and doing a pass through to get that module information. You can also do get module, you can, anything that gets you that module information. And what that does is that tells the call operator, hey, I want you to go inside this module and I want you to run this command as if you were a command inside the module. And so that way I'm able to run this detect current terminal profile, which is one of the private methods inside that module. Um, without having to have it exposed as a full command line. And it will eventually be exposed. Um, the main reason that this was a private function is that um, I will eventually be improving the current setup of the tools that this will just be implicit. If you don't specify what profile you want to work on, it will just assume you want to do it in your currently running Windows terminal. And so all I'm going to do is detect that profile and save it to a global variable. And boom, so it detected it. And if you look at this, this looks really f like, a lot like that JSON file, doesn't it? It's because it's all the same stuff. This is just an import from the JSON file and converted to a PowerShell object. And I got all my stuff, my GUID, my name, my command line, starting directory, all that stuff. But that is this terminal. I'm in PowerShell Preview. It knows I'm in PowerShell Preview. So that I know I'm in PowerShell Preview, great. Maybe I can do some fun stuff with that. How about, let's just start with something simple. Let's try um, changing the terminal background. So again, real, uh, oops, the wrong one. Let's redetect again. So to change the terminal background, um, just set MS terminal profile, the name of my profile, which I'm pulling from that global variable I said earlier, and the background color. And I'm just using an HTML color there. Um, that's an easy color for sort of a deep red. Um, and then sleep for five seconds, and then set it back. So I mean, again, that's the command. And my terminal turned red. Wait five seconds. And it came back. Again, all it did was go into that JSON file, change that little line, and save it. Terminal automatically recognized it. I'm going to change it and did that cool fade effect. I didn't do anything about that fade effect. They added that in 0.6. And you know, again, just, just for fun, but it's, it's kind of nice. So cool, we, now we know that in the terminal that we're working on, we can change the aspects of our terminal in real time. That's really cool. Like, I don't know of any other terminal that I can do that in. Usually I have to do it and shut it down and restart it. Okay, well, what's some other cool stuff we can do with that? Okay, maybe I don't, you know, here I'm on the dark theme, my whole laptop's all dark themed, et cetera. Maybe you want to force the light theme for just a little while. So to do that, just set MS terminal setting. Again, this time, this is a more global setting, so we're not doing any individual setting. Um, we're just going to do a global setting. I'm going to say, I want my theme to be, sorry, I should blow that up. I want my theme to be the light theme. And then I'm going to wait five seconds and then set it back. Just clear, clear that setting and go back to whatever's in that underlying defaults JSON. So uh, I'll go and start that one. And look, my, now I'm in, I got the light theme. And in about five seconds, it goes back because I cleared it. All right, let's go, let's go even further. You know, let's, let's change the font size just for fun. So we're going to first warn, hey, we're going to change the font size. And then we're going to change the font size. And honestly, because I'm doing this presentation, it's probably going to shrink. <laughs> but, um, but it'll change the font size, sleep five seconds, then change it back. So we'll start that. It's going to blow up. And it's going to shrink, I bet. 
or it's going to be just basically about the same, probably. It'd be fun if I zoomed it to just, yeah, I zoomed it to just the right size. That's hilarious. So let, let me make it really tiny just to do that again. So it'll blow up. Try that again. But now it blew up. That was, that was weird. I got it like right on the uh, right on the percentage. That was crazy. So then it shrunk back down. Okay. So, um, so now we got that. Okay, great. Well, we know all this stuff we can customize. Um, what about like themes? Like I like how like one thing has different things. And by the way, one thing I didn't really show is that um, if I'm in Windows PowerShell, you know, I showed how I have my sort of familiar kind of coloring where it's like yellow for keywords and blue for quotes. But if I'm in like say PowerShell Core, oh, this looks different, you know? It's a little bit more effective, a little bit different kind of thing, but still very similar to what it was. And if I'm, in, if I'm in preview, you know, oh wait, these quotes are orange and such like that. Uh, it's like that, it's almost as if that theme is very similar to a certain Visual Studio Code theme. So I made a, I made a theme that is exactly like what the, what the Visual Studio Code One Dark Plus theme is. Because the default theme of Visual Studio Code, I think is the best theme. Like I went through a whole bunch of different themes trying to find one. I'm just like, you know what, the default theme's great. Like I really like it. I really like the colors. I really like how it highlights things. And so I just made it so that this terminal is the same way. And so that same echo, et cetera, it's the same fonts. So like, well, how, how flexible are these fonts? Well, um, well, there's some of the default color schemes. So this is a little more complicated, but it's pretty, again, this is just pretty straightforward PowerShell. Just a few more steps. First thing we're just gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, let's throw up a test theme pattern there. I'm gonna use a tool called Color Tool, which comes with Windows Terminal. All it does is just throw out this nice grid of all the potential like basic colors. And it supports 24-bit color, but this is for like when you're doing like when you're doing like foreground, you know, when you're doing like right host foreground color yellow or right host foreground color red, that's what these are gonna color cover. Um, then I'm gonna say, hey, in five seconds, I'm gonna start cycling through colors. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my terminal to null. I'm just gonna null out the colors so that we have a neutral start. Um, and then for the schemes, I'm gonna get content again from that default JSON file I showed you earlier, read it into a PowerShell object, and I guess I could just highlight here, which make it easier to understand. By the way, all this is like right click, copy. It, and actually I'll show you something even cooler than that. Um, this got recently added. So typically like, you cut and paste from terminals and you wanna show somebody something. Um, come on, why are you being goofy? So you want to show something, say something, you know, you copy it, but when you paste it now, it saves all the HTML, this is HTML formatting. It passes through the format, and this works in Outlook, et cetera. So when you're like putting an issue up or anything like that or trying to explain to somebody, you can show them exactly what your console looked like with all the syntax highlighting and everything. That's really nice. I use that all the time, as opposed to like when I have to paste just like blank text with no highlighting, it's really hard to convey what, what my issue was. Whereas if you have like throw issue, like all the issue text is still in red for you. So, um, so again, we're gonna do this, and so what we're gonna do with this is we're just gonna go through each of these schemes. We're first gonna fetch all the different schemes that are part of the default JSON, which is first I'm gonna convert it to a JSON file, and then I'm just dotting into the properties. So as you saw, like there was a section for schemes and then name. This is just sort of a quick shorthand syntax to get all the names of all the different schemes that are in the default file. And then for each of them, I'm gonna throw a little progress bar up at the top so I know which theme I'm on. I'm gonna tell the terminal to use that scheme for my particular shell that I'm in now, which in this case will be PowerShell Preview, and then wait a second, and then do the next one, and then do the next one, and then do the next one until I get done with them. And then I'll reset things back to how they were. So let's see what happens. Starting in five seconds, there's the test pattern. And so there's Campbell PowerShell, there's Vintage, there's the one half dark, the one half light that I talked about, there's Solarized, there's light, and there you go, back. So there's, there's just the built-in themes you can use right off the bat, and all you have to do is change those individual items. But we need to go deeper. I mean, that's not enough themes for me. Well, it turns out that there's this site that has console themes for over 200 different themes, and they've made Windows PowerShell JSONs for them all. They, somebody just made a script to convert them from one to the other. And then somebody else, me, made a script to convert them all into VS Code themes. But here's the ones for these. So all right, let's try this. Looks very similar. We're gonna, um, I, I pre-downloaded these themes and just put them in one big JSON just so that this wasn't dependent on your internet connection. And then we're gonna convert those to a JSON. I don't know why I keep pointing over there when I can just do it here, sorry. So we're gonna take this, 
we're going to convert it to a JSON, and then we're just going to sort them by name so they, they come in in alphabetical order ni nicely. And then I got my current configuration, which is my current profile JSON, and I'm going to convert it to a JSON file again. Just turn it into PowerShell objects so I can work with it in PowerShell, how I know and love. Then I take my, uh, um, the schemes, the schemes that are part of my thing, do this same test pattern thing, do this same, hey, I'm about to start cycling through, only this time, for every one of those new schemes, which is about 200 or so, I'm going to do that same progress again, but I'm just going to add that one scheme to my um, profile and then set my terminal to that one scheme. And by doing that, instead of like writing all of the schemes to the profile and having to read and write that JSON back and forth over and over and over again, this is just a faster way of doing it. But you could do it that other way. It would just be slower. And so then I'm just going to get that. And then once I have my color scheme, I'm just going to set the color scheme for my profile to that. And then I'm going to take that profile and write it back down. And then I'm going to sleep for about a fifth of a second and do it again. So let's see what happens. I know it's easy to read on the screen there, but there's, we're going to go through. So when you, when you see the one you like, hit Control C and then pick that theme and put it on your computer. But see, like, there's no end to the customization here. I mean, you have so many options in terms of themes, different colors, et cetera. And I'm going to show something funny. Because this affects this one profile, if you have um, multiple windows open, it's going to kill my computer. So it's going to take a second. Like, see, it's rotating through all my text on that one, too. Yeah. Well, I would, except on my surface, the problem is on my surface, it's about to catch on fire, as you can see from everything it's doing working on that. But yeah, yeah. Like if you if you want to give yourself epilepsy, you know, over a course of two years, that's a great that's a great plan. But that gives you an idea. It's like every single profile that's on that I term, you can just keep cycling through them, just like you have VS Code themes until you find the one you like, and you can have different ones for different themes, different ones for different workloads. You can have the same. You can have five different PowerShell profiles, but maybe you have one that's for like one customer. Maybe you have one that's for your dev environment. Maybe you have one for production. And you give them all different colors and different themes so that when you're working in that environment, you can feel safe that you're not accidentally typing delete on the production environment. Because whenever you're in the production environment, you know you've got the terminal with the big red window that's within the construction. You know, and set the background to a big construction bar if you want. All right. So let's get back to the demo script again. And I'll show the demo script here towards the end. Just I want to get through the main thing for the stream here. All right, so, um, so we've gone through those colors. So another thing is the terminal now supports 24-bit color, and it supports all the ANSI terminal escape sequences. So if you don't know what any of that means, don't worry about it. It just means that you can do fancy stuff like this. So this is just a script that will um, take a, we're going to pick random numbers from 255, pick an RGB, you know, it'll just pick a random RGB color. And then that RGB color will get put in a string builder. It'll put in this special ANSI escape sequence. That backtick E is new in PowerShell 6. It used to be this weird character combination thing you had to do. Now you can just do backtick E. And say, I'm going to do this special ANSI code and put in my RGB color. Like this, this code is just a special code that says, I instruct the terminal to set the foreground color to this color. And then I've got this special block character, which is a special character that's just, it's just, it's just a big block. So it makes it really easy to see. Um, and then it's just going to loop through those. And then I do something a little fancier, too, where like, hey, I'm going to get whatever the width of my window is. And so I'm going to generate these until I hit whatever the width of my window is. And then I'm going to export it. And then I'm going to start over. So what that lets me do is no matter how big my terminal is, this is going to come out in nice, nice sheets of lines. If I make my terminal small, it'll come out in small, nice sheets of lines. If I make my terminal big, big sheets of lines. So let's see what happens. Here's all my colors. So again, and. You know, you got 16 million colors at your disposal, and this is, I just randomly generated a whole bunch of them. But anywhere in here, you know, you, you're not limited to just the colors that are available in the themes and such where you're 16. You can make prompts and everything that use a complete range of colors however you see fit. And you can force those colors to be your, like, if you want your, if you have a theme you're distributing and you want certain colors to always be a certain color regardless of what somebody set their theme to, you can use these kind of ANSI terminal escape sequences to do that. But this is just to show that like, you know, all the colors of the rainbow are available in there, and you're not just limited to like the 16 colors a lot of terminals tend to be limited to. OK, um, so then there's another thing. So you might have noticed this, this um, font's kind of nice. It's got kind of real nice rounded things to it. Um, 
Windows Terminal introduced a new font called Cascadia Code. Um, and it was named, at the, this project used to be called Project Cascadia after the whole Cascadia Northwest region here. Um, in fact, they had a naming contest and one of the options was Seattle Code. And I'm just like, no, no, I'm voting for Cascadia Code. That sounds nice. Um, so Cascadia Code's the new font name. Um, they did recently add in what are called power line characters. If you look at my prompt, it has that nice little like rounded bit to the prompt. Those are what are called power line characters. There's nice ways to like string prompts together. Um, and then somebody else has gone and patched in this thing called nerd fonts, which is basically just a ton of glyphs that are almost like emojis, but they're actual like font characters so that you don't have to do all the emoji stuff to get them to work. Um, but you have to have that font used. And so I'm using a version font called Delugia Code, which is just somebody who took Cascadia Code, patched it with this stuff, but then they couldn't call it Cascadia Code anymore for trademark reasons, so now they call it Delugia Code. So I just download that, install it, and use it. But one of the nice things about that is that it's a really nice, like I've taken very quickly to it. Like I really like this font. Um, there's other ones like Fira Code, et cetera, Consolos, wh whatever you want. You know, you, you can use whatever font you're comfortable with. I've just really taken a liking to this font. It also works cross-platform. And so, but one of the things it has is these things called ligatures. So in my font, you see all these glyphs here, all these kind of funky looking glyphs here. These are actually just like equal arrows or double equals or exclamation mark um, arrows. And what it does is that it's able to see that, hey, you did, a, you did a dash arrow, and it'll just turn it into a ligature. And what these ligatures are great for programming in PowerShell and such because they don't look so much like characters. They really catch your eye as that's a special operation. It's a special operator character. And it's just a display thing. Like when you save it, it still saves in that, those basic settings. But it really helps like when you're working either in, um, you know, if you're working in Sapien or you're working in any IDE or you're working in the terminal to be able to see like, okay, I want this means something special. Um, it's not as important for like veterans, but like for, especially for people who are like new to PowerShell or new to programming languages, it's really nice to see that, okay, when I type these two things together, it actually meant something. And so what my script here is gonna do is it's gonna, it just, um, it's just gonna output this but then the next thing it's going to do is it's going to switch to a font that doesn't have ligatures, which is Consolos. So you can see that it's the exact same text, it's just being interpreted differently, and then it'll switch back. So in five seconds it'll switch. And it's trunk, but you can kind of see these, um, see they're just normal, normal characters, and then they come back. So you can type and have all that and see it that way, but then when you go to save it, it saves in the normal characters. It doesn't save in some special character type format. Okay, so that's a lot of the functionality that's in the terminal, a lot of the nice things about the font, and now it's time to like really abuse this concept of being able to change the terminal in real time. So, this is something I made a while ago and Scott retweeted it and everybody got crazy about it, so. Um, so this thing will first, import a command that I have called search Giphy, which is a, is, is a PowerShell command that I made that's basically an API for the Giphy GIF engine website, where you just you search Giphy and it'll, it'll, it'll come back with the information about it, most importantly, the URL. And so obviously important, I put a big thing there is because this just does an IEX of some random URL, it's gonna pop up a warning just reminding you, never run code that you've never read because I could just easily throw a virus in there or something, whatever, and so, you know, you always want to review everything, you know, don't believe everything you read on the internet, including code. Um, but I just, I'm just gonna have that in there. So it's gonna download that function and run it in my thing, so I'll have search Giphy. Then I'm just gonna fetch a random GIF, and so by default what this does is it just searches the top 20 most popular GIFs and picks a random one. But it has all kinds of functionality like that I added in that like, you know, it has a, there's a, it turns out Giphy is API has a weirdness factor. So you can do dash, so my module you can type dash weirdness like seven and it'll do this crazy fuzzy logic to like match whatever keyword you chose. And it supports tags and all that stuff. Um, my, uh, my wife's terminal when she works on stuff, I set hers on default so that when it loads, she loves bats. And so it just searches Giphy for a cute bat GIF and plays it once for two seconds and then that's it. So every time she opens her terminal, she gets some cute bat gif. Um, so it's going to get that, and then it's going to say, just, just for kind of debug or kind of um, gratification sake, it's going to say what that gif is. That part's not necessary. And then it's going to run this command that I wrote, which is part of the MS Terminal gif, or excuse me, MS Terminal settings module called invoke MS Terminal gif, and then stretch it to the full screen. So what this command does, and again, all the code's there, but basically what, it's all written in PowerShell. There's no .NET or anything here. It's all pure PowerShell. What that does is that will get the GIF, 
And what it will do is it will actually start a run space in the background so you get your terminal back right away as opposed to waiting on it. It'll start a run space that will in the background go out, edit that JSON, set it to this GIF of the background image, and then wait, wait whatever time, by the default's five seconds. Um, you know, you can set the timer based on the parameter. But once that timeout hits, and then it'll go back and transparently set it back. So what the net effect that you get is it's like you're playing a video on your screen and then, and then stopping it. Because one of the things with Windows Terminal is the backgrounds you can set to not just GIFs, but animated GIFs. And you've probably seen this, you know, if you've seen any demo of Windows Terminal, people love to show this off. Well, I mean, and you saw it here, like, like that's just an animated GIF that I set in the background and I set the justification to the lower right and I set it to not explode all over the place. Um, but th you can also point them to ones on the internet, and so you don't have to download them. It'll download them for you. So I'm tethering off my phone right now. Let's see if I still have connection. We'll see if this works or not, depending on how big the GIF is. Yeah, it looks like I'm still pretty stable. Let's see what happens. So this is just going to grab a random GIF off the internet. So this could be really bad for me. Let's find out. <laughs> it's usually pretty safe. Like, I I've never had anything come up. So again, never run code from the internet. You haven't reviewed. Let's see what we get. Did it blow up? No, I think it played it. There we go. We, we got a Toby oh, Keith gift. That's disappointing. Disappointing. Well, the, there is a not safe for work tag on all those, and this by default filters those out. So, <laughs> sorry. It, it, yeah, it, it, was, it was calculated risk. Let's do it again. That was fun. Let's do it again. See what happens. What do we get this time? That is definitely a random gif. I don't even know what that's about. One more time. One more time. And later I can show, like, we can tune and tweak this if you want to play with it. Because you can do search Giphy with, like, a particular keyword, all that stuff. What do we get? What do we get? Sometimes, sometimes the links are dead, so it doesn't go. Oh, there we go. I like that. That was good. All right. So that's the end of that section of the demo. I'm going to show one other thing here. So one thing you may have been noticing is that my prompt doesn't look normal. Like, this is what the normal prompt looks like, function prompt. This is what the default prompt looks like. Maybe it'll have your path, that kind of a thing. But you're probably noticing that like I have this kind of funky prompt. Well, this is a PowerShell module that I've been working on called Power Prompt. So the way the Power Prompt works is I'm going to do a new Power Prompt builder. I may have to import it real quick. Actually, I, gotta, I know what I got to do. Let me do a test prompt. New Power Prompt build. Let me blow this up. Actually, let's, let's do this in the, do in the Zen mode here. I'll blow it up a bit. So, um, oh, well, there's, I already spoiled it, dang it. I'll, I'll do it again. Oh, man, so I get an error on my terminal to oops. Oh, man. And you also notice my terminal updated to let me know my last command didn't succeed. Put a little bomb there. All right, I'll, I'll do this part first then. I was, I was going to preamble it, but screw it. I'll just show the. So I go to my home. See, it's still, and that's, that's a little house. It's a home. It's for, like, home documents. And, okay, well, how about, like, let me do home projects. Oh, look, it recognized that I have a project and replaced it with a nice little project under construction icon so my terminal stays nice and short. But I'm still in the same place. I could do PWD. I'm still there in projects. Sorry, let me blow that up so it's a little more obvious. And again, they're, because they're emojis, they're all vector graphics, so they always look really nice when they scale up. And then let me go to one of my projects. Let me go to, like, this guy. Hey, look, all my Git information came up by default. And in fact, if I do the same thing in VS Code, because VS Code has the stuff down at the bottom, um, this module will automatically recognize that you're in VS Code and doesn't show this, because it knows you already have it down at the bottom. Yeah? So you saw that in that demo video about the links and stuff? Yeah, so they made that video as a concept. That's not in there yet. Like, they showed something else about like installing plugins and extensions. That's not in there yet either. <laughs> That's coming. It's coming. Like, it is still on the roadmap, but that currently doesn't exist. But yes, the idea is that you would be able to like, have text links like that and have them um, you know, link to whatever you need, et cetera. For now, yeah. I, I'm sorry, yeah. So the question was, was that could I make like these icons that I made um, hyperlinks? And like, currently, no. Because I, you saw that in the little splash video that Microsoft made. Not actually a thing yet, um, but it, it is coming as a thing. Uh, the big thing about all this, though, is that this stuff is not Windows terminal specific. I don't know if you, you may have seen it every time I went back to Visual Studio Code, but you'll notice down here I have the same, same kind of prompt thing going on. In fact, I probably should do test prompt since it's, that one's a little finicky. 
No, test prompt's not gonna work because I know why. But, um, but uh, the aspects of the module are to, are to be fluid for wherever you are and recognize whether like, for, for instance, like VS Code still sucks with certain emojis and so it automatically detects that and fixes those things. And all that's here in the settings under power prompt settings. So here's some of the things you can do. So like, let's, so this automatically detects Windows Terminal and it knows what Windows Terminal can support. But let's say like it turns out my terminal doesn't support emoji. It automatically adapts to characters that aren't emojis. Let's say my terminal doesn't support nerd fonts. So like for instance, this, this wrench in uh, key thing, this is actually like a font character in that extended character set I was talking about. But let's say it doesn't support that. It just doesn't do that collapsing anymore. And it'll do things where like um, if you go really far deep into a directory, it'll put like a dot, dot, dot in the middle so that your prompt still stays short. And it doesn't just have to be git stuff. So for instance, um, let's say I have, you know, I was talking about Terraform earlier and how much I love it. Um, here's a Terraform project I have. See this purple bit here? It lets me know what Terraform workspace I'm in. And so any, and all these are, just, all these are basically just plugins where you just write the plugin. I'll show what the prompt, what the um, terminal thing looks like. But you can make, you can customize your own prompt however you want it to look. So the base of this, let me go back to home. And this all works not just, like I said, in Windows Terminal, but like uh, if I go to my Alpine Linux instance, see it has the same thing. Blow that up. It's got the same bombs. It's got the same projects. Works the same even though it's on Linux. I can remote out to my, um, my, my tiny cloud out there and it all works the same there because it's just how the prompt is being interpreted. Now if you want, um, the way that the prompt works is the prompt is actually just a method. There's just a function called prompt. So, and another big thing about this is that the reason I didn't adapt one of the options that are already out there like oh my ZS, or oh my posh and such like that is they have dependencies on stuff that's super slow. Um, so for instance, my prompt, four milliseconds to process. Like, Oh my posh takes like 800 milliseconds. So every time you hit enter, you have to wait for it to come back. And like that, that doesn't fly with me for a prompt. So I've worked very hard to like, it's all still written purely in PowerShell, although it does drop to .NET like, it doesn't ever like do an add type to .NET, but it drops to drop .NET methods and use things like lists and stuff to really make it efficient. Um, but that makes it super efficient. So, but the key of this is just this power prompt builder. So this is, this is a PowerShell class that is just your prompt. I'll just do a git member, and you'll see, so it's just type of prompt builder. Now this is a PowerShell class, it's not a .NET class, and I can show the uh, code behind it. But basically you start with this, and you have your prompt and your prompt color seed. And the nice thing about PowerShell classes is you can add things to them to make sort of native PowerShell stuff work. So $t plus my prompt will, in the background, it actually there's this special addition method you can add to a PowerShell class to have it do whatever you want. So in the background, I'm actually taking it and having it added to this special prompt array. So let me do, let's add Poshpug. Okay, so now I got two things. And so let's look at these items. So each of these is actually an object, it's not just text. So I got my prompt and some customization if I want. If I want to specify a certain kind of separator, special kind of foreground, special kind of background. And then there's this prompt color seed thing. This is so that, um, I'll just show what happens. So now I have this, all I gotta do is convert this to a string, and look, I got a new prompt. And I handle all the incredibly annoying crap behind here, which I'll show you what that incredibly annoying crap looks like. I'm just gonna pull out the escape characters. If I do it right, which I didn't. So this is what that prompt actually looks like in ANSI, like this part. And I can interpret all this for you. I, have a, I, actually, have a, I actually wrote a parser to make this like much more human readable. But in short, it's basically, these are all the ANSI escape codes that say things like, I know this one by heart, this is set, set background color, set foreground color, and then the, that text, and then reset the colors afterwards, and then set these colors, and then do the prompt, and then there's a thing here where just because of the way that those separators work, you have to take the color of the previous one and then match it to the front one so it makes that nice flow where it shows like, see like the way this flows is this is actually a foreground character and then it has to know the background of the next one in order to do, it's a, it's a fucking mess. Like it's, <laughs> I have all these functions to make all this stuff work, but this is the, the really nice thing about these things. Once you define them into a function or a class, it can track all that state and make it really easy. And so, and I'm not, you know, if I want to add more to this, you know, another. 
put in a string. So there, there's you just add on the next thing. If I want to change my default um, color seed, let's do whatever. Now it does different colors. Maybe I want to force one of the colors. Dollar t dot prompt where prompt text. Okay, so I got just this one guy. Let's say I want to set the uh, foreground color, or let's do the background color. Let's do a nice, like, dark gray. And actually, this should work with just named colors, if I remember. Let's do, let's do, uh, let's do sky blue. Can't remember if that's one that's in the system or not, but we'll find out. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> let's fix that. But again, that, again, that, that's the best thing. Is like when you screw, like it, it puts some good humor to the frustration too. Like you know, whenever you screw something, it's like ah crap, I screwed that up. Uh, by the way, if you haven't seen PowerShell Seven, PowerShell Seven has these really nice, very terse error messages now, um, and you can do this thing called get error, which will get you all the extra stuff if you want it. So that's really nice. Um, it's uh, um, it's not enabled by default. You have to do this thing error view. So like it's a special concise view thing. So this is new in PowerShell 7, but you have this nice concise view. So like you know when you screw something up, um, it's very specific. And what's as you can see here, like when I ran a script and it screwed up in the script, it gives you this automatic thing about what line you were on, where you screwed it up, and pointing exactly where the error was, which is really nice. That's that's a huge improvement, especially for people who are new to PowerShell and don't know how to read through those giant those giant error messages that terrify you every time they come up. So let's fix that thing. Let's do a, a little more conservative uh, background color. So let's go back up to my command that I had here. Let's just try blue. And see, set that one specifically to blue. So in building these prompts, um, let me go ahead and open this project just to show what it looks like. Or whoops, I forgot, I rearranged my stuff. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, there's, a, there's the bomb I was working on. It's a nice little preview. Uh, so um, here is the class. And so it's a pretty straightforward class, because the way I like to build classes is I like to write all the methods first, and then the class is basically just like an interface to those methods. Um, it just, because PowerShell classes have a lot of limitations, so I like to write the commandlets first so that if I can't get the class to work how I want it to, I still have the functions and commandlets to do what I want. Um, but here's some of the stuff, there's a prompt segment. Uh, this is just what defines that one segment in terms of these things. It's pretty straightforward, there's nothing really fancy here. Um, the prompt builder has some things like those builders, and then here's those fancy methods, this OP addition, OP subtraction. This is what makes that plus work, because when, when, when I do the this plus this, it just runs this function that takes the left and the right of what was the left and the right of the plus and runs that function, which runs my add function, which then in turn just runs a commandlet. Uh, where's my add? And here's, that, here's the two strings. So you know, I saw I could convert to a string. Whenever you, call stri whenever you do that string casting, it just runs a method called two strings. So you can replace that in any class or any object and have it change to whatever string you want. So then, um, and so then what you get is, um, I have a templating engine for this that um, I don't have all the way. It's gonna just be a nice little YAML kind of thing, but like, here's, here's basically the template for my default prompt. And some of this, so we start out, here's that error that we talked about and it runs this little git last command error, and inside of that does all like the, the determination of if, if it was an error, if it was an error, are we in Windows Terminal? If we're in Windows Terminal, throw a bomb. If we're not, change that little icon. And it doesn't really like change the icon, it just adds it to the prompt. It just puts it in that prompt segment and adds it, sticks it on. And then like, you know, if, if one of my settings is I don't wanna see the git status even in the column, you know, I got all those global settings, don't do that otherwise, run my little thing which just runs git, does a git status, and then parses it and throws it into that nice little prompt thing there. And then the Terraform workspace. And then if, um, if I'm doing a debug, if I'm doing a debug and it pauses, 
it'll turn orange and it'll show a little bug on the side so that I know I'm in debug mode. Like I really like just real simple, nice little contextual informations about where you're at. And then this is the thing that puts the prompt together. So it's a two line prompt. You've probably seen every once in a while there's a little like timer next to it. So every command that I run, it times it in the background with a .NET stopwatch. And just lets me, it's really handy, like if you, run, if you run a long batch command, when it's done, you can look, you can just look at that little thing and say, oh, it took about five minutes. You know, you can get that information from Git history and stuff like that, but just having it right there is, is really nice. Especially when you're, when you're like me and you're constantly trying to like tune, tweak, and optimize performance, you're like, all right, let me do it this way. Okay, that took 300 milliseconds, let me do it with like a list object. Oh, that only took like four milliseconds, so clearly I want to do it that way. And, um, and then it just goes and writes out the function. So if you want to see what the actual function looks like, you can always see it because all functions are stored on a PowerShell drive. So dir function, there's all my functions. Git item function prompt. And then I want to see the source. Or it's not source, it's something else. Pull it up a bit again, sorry. Script block, that's what it is. If you haven't seen this syntax before, this is just for each, bring out the script block. It's just, it's a real shorthand way to like get a property without having to do like parentheses and then dot, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's just basic, it's, you know, percentage for each, it's just doing this. And so it invokes this uh, script. And I did this so that it's really easy to manage because it's just a little there. Okay, so you look at this variable and see what it is. Oops, wrong, wrong one. So yeah, it's not a short script, but you can see it's, the, it's that exact same theming engine and pulls all that. So this, this, prompt script just runs every time I hit enter, it runs through all that stuff. But again, because I have it so highly optimized, you know, it only takes five milliseconds, three milliseconds, four milliseconds to do all that, calculate, see where I'm at, you know, change my, change my home directory to the little squiggly, or if I have emojis enabled, you know, do that. So it's something I'm working on, it's something I plan to, um, once I have it to a point, um, get nicely released and, um, Hopefully it'll, it'll be a much better like templating engine than a lot of the ones that exist out there. Because I would love to have something in PowerShell that is like Spaceship or, uh, or like the ZSH themes that are out there. They're excellent. They got a lot of context. You know, they provide you a lot of value beyond just being pretty. And so that's, so it's a thing that I've been working on for uh, PowerShell. So, so that's pretty much the summary. I mean, since the, whatever your prompt is goes hand in hand with Windows Terminal, I just kind of wanted to show that. But I mean, it pretty much, um, that's kind of the core of everything that's in Windows Terminal right now. There's some more stuff coming, like there will be a graphical editor for the settings. Um, there's a bunch of other items, but it's, it's I mean, it's my day-to-day. -day. Like when I'm not in my IDE, if I just need to hack something together real quick, I'm in Windows Terminal. And with, as I showed, because you have remoting and stuff, it doesn't matter if like you have servers and stuff that only support two or three. You can still remote into them, even if they're on PowerShell 2, and work with them, but do them inside the Windows Terminal with the Windows Terminal themes and context and all that kind of stuff. So, um, oh, I, I'll, I'll skip it. I had a demo where like when you run a pester test, like it changes all the pass fails to emojis of like check mark or bomb, et cetera. It's a little easier to read. But, um, but I mean, you kind of get the idea from here. Is that it? You can, the emojis are all written with just this kind of back tick U command. And then you can just go to, um, you can go online to the Emojipedia. This is only true in PowerShell 6 and above. PowerShell 5, you have to do something you have to do an ugly command to make it work, which you can see in my code because I made it, everything I do is 5.1 plus compatible. And, um, but all these different emoji, I don't know, that might come up with something. Oops, oh, it'll blow up, that's for sure. So yeah, that's not a real, oh, is that a real thing? Yeah, it's a real thing. It almost looks like PowerShell. So, um, but so the, you know, you can look up on the Emojipedia and find all of them, but you can generate all the different emojis. In fact, um, part of the Power Prompt module there's a piece that's in as a private that I'll make public that just has a, it has a hash table of all the different emojis, all the different glyphs, so that you can just reference them by name and it'll just, it'll bring it forward. So yeah, thanks very much. Um, I just, uh, I hope that was helpful to give you an idea of like the new Windows PowerShell is helpful. If you use a Mac day to day and Linux day to day, sorry, that most of this probably wasn't helpful, but at the same time, um, all the prompt customization stuff works regardless of what platform you're on. So thank you very much. Awesome, uh, man, that, that was some really interesting stuff. I, I, the, the new terminal is just really exciting and uh, PowerShell prompt like theming and just messing with 
uh, your prompt. Like, I, I've gone down like multi-day rabbit holes on that, and and it, it's just so so useful to have that context, you know, uh, on your command line. And then when you go give demos to other people about some of the stuff that you build, like almost every time when you're done with the demo, they're like, "How'd you do that with your prompt?" And you're like, "Well, yeah. Well, let me show you." And it it just looks it just makes you look like uh, makes you look really slick, like like you know what you're doing. Um, so. Anyway, thanks to, to Justin for putting the presentation together, uh, putting a, a really slick presentation together. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, Viewpoint and uh, Sapien. Uh, just momentarily, we will stop the stream. Uh, but if you want to reach us on, um, on Twitter, I think we're at PDX Poshpug, or you want to reach me at randomdown 7 you can message, message us on the Meetup page. If you had any questions from this, or maybe you think about any questions later, uh, feel free to uh, put any questions to any of those channels, and I'll make sure that uh, somebody gets them, that, that Justin gets them, or, or whatever, and uh, you know we'll get some answers out to you. For everybody that's here in person, we will continue to uh, enjoy the food and uh, drinks. We'll uh, take a look at the swag table and just do some general, you know, networking and uh, and chatting about uh, PowerShell or otherwise. So thanks for watching, everybody. See you next time. <laughs>